Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm also welcoming people who you can't see because there is crowds, hordes uh, of people online. We don't know where. Uh, we've just been working out the audio for them, as I said before. So, welcome to whether you're here or whether you are here uh, electronically. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we meet on, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, to offer my respect to their elders past, present, and uh, in the future, their continuing relationship with the land, which has never been exceeded, and, uh, and a special welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here, and indeed any Indigenous people from uh, Taiwan or elsewhere. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, in fact the last speaker of our conference, Remembering Taiwan's Martial Law, um, which has been very successful over the last few days, very, very interesting. And I think that Mark's paper today, Mark's lecture today, will be a highlight. Uh, Mark Harrison is a senior lecturer at the University of Tasmania. Um, he's also been one of the people outside ANU most for most closely and for a long time associated with the Australian Centre on China and the World. He's an old friend. Um, but more to the point, uh, for this lecture, he is probably Australia's greatest He is not like some of us confined to uh, uh, this discipline or that discipline. I've heard Mark talk illuminatingly and with great knowledge and deep knowledge on Taiwanese history, its literature, film, its politics, its international relations, and so on and so forth. Um, he knows, he has a, a really deep knowledge of uh, Taiwan past and present. But more than that, he brings to um, his study of Taiwan a deep um, academic, theoretical and philosophical knowledge as well. So this isn't just a, a matter for Mark of reportage or uh, informing people about what's going on. Mark is also, in my experience anyway, in our field, more broadly Chinese studies, Sancho studies, one of the deepest thinkers in Australia in this field. So it's a very great pleasure to um, introduce Mark, uh, an old friend of the centre, a, a very old friend and very supportive of the ANU Taiwan Studies Program, to give today's keynote lecture. Mark, thank you. Well, thank you, Ben, for that very kind introduction. Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming today. Thanks to everyone who's listening online. Uh, thanks also for the invitation from the Australian Centre on China and the World. It's fantastic that um, the Taiwan Studies Activities Center continues. It's a long uh, journey for the center over many, many years, and um, long may it continue into the future. And a special thanks also to Nancy, of course, um, who has uh, done just so much work throughout this conference to get everything together. Um, the conference began um, a few days ago with a screening of the film's attention. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the film. I acknowledge the panel this morning, which is very illuminating. There's a you know, great commonality between some of my points here. So, the film's attention, the film adaptation of the horror video game, uh, which addresses Taiwan's history, its you know, political violence, and its legacy of trauma. Um, uh, in the game, the past literally points uh, the players as spectres, connecting the spirit world in Taiwan, the world that is distinctively alive you know, in Taiwan's real year, with Taiwan's political history. The film is a bit more literal. Uh, the film activates the tropes of horror cinema, um, and it also references the video game in interesting ways. Um, the, the intention of the film, the monster, is literally a demonic embodiment of the authoritarian state, and an um, anthropomorphized creature in an RSC military uniform. Um, its face is a mirror, and the front end characters in the, in the film you know, represent this uh, Taiwan's authoritarian. Near the film's denouement, uh, the character Fang is asked by a commissioner Bai. Uh, he says, Is it so bad to forget? 
to leave all that pain in the past. And she says, no, Maria, no, I won't forget, I won't forget again. So at that moment, at the end of the film, the mirrored face of the, of the, the demon cracks, and the monster is defeated by the power of memory. And indeed, uh, defeated by the power to remember. In the film, memory is about confronting the past and perpetrating an injustice. Um, but the film also addresses the questions of complicity, justice, responsibility, and forgiveness. The film has some issues around uh, narrative, um, it's gender politics. I think uh, it's very Taiwan specific and wouldn't necessarily travel outside of Taiwan. But it still captures the development of a structure and a purpose to memory. So a lived memory of events and circumstances in the 1960s and 70s is rendered as a national political act, as a practice of truth and reconciliation that draws in politics, history, and cultural representation. So memory is a moral force that can defeat uh, Taiwan's historical demons, and remembering the past is a moral act. The tension is finding a purpose in remembering uh, that places memory at the center of Taiwan's identity and its aspiration for nationhood. So the film is describing memory as a force that grounds the moral purpose of the Taiwanese nation itself. So all nations remember events and individuals uh, with particular styles, of cultural representation, institutional practices, and so on for the purpose of national moral renewal. National memory in all national contexts establishes and renews the understanding of right and wrong upon which a nation is founded. This scene is stays hardly unproblematic. There are countless exam national examples for which the partiality of memory, acts of forgetting, are part of their national memorialization practice, not least in Australia, where we forget much um, in our nationhood. But for detention, the act of remembering the Martin Law period and the specific way it's remembered as acts of violence and injustice against innocence by the state is a good, it's a moral good. It structures memory around democracy, freedom, and justice, and suffering of those individuals who sought to oppose a capricious state in the name of righteousness and justice, delay but not deny. So, detention is an example of how the past, uh, in Taiwan, the past has found distinctive ways into the present in recent years. Done so through art, popular culture, political protest, memorialization, consumer culture, even video games, that have sought to capture personal and subjective experiences of the martial law period and destabilize them and release them from being merely recollections or unexamined illusions to contextualize them in the politics of, of the time through a process in which they've been, been imbued with moral force. Now, this process of history of its own, uh, there was a time, uh, some of us might remember in the 2000s, when remembering the martial law period could be found in culture, so it commodified and um, uh, nostalgia. Um, uh, and also as high culture. So the Taiwan Storyland uh, 1960s themed mall in the basement of the Asian World Building in, in um, uh, the Tung Chow opposite the Taipei Main Station, um, uh, with its references to Joe Town, uh, the, the, the town of the north. And there's one example. So you go there and um, you could eat uh, like an ice cream parlor, you could eat uh, noodle soup, and there was a room set up to, to simulate uh, classrooms and and so on. Uh, that's one example. Tuxia Sien's uh, film Triptych Three Times is a, another one. It's, it's from high culture, which has a, uh, in its second section, a charming and nostalgia steep section set at the pool hall with the Chang Chen and Si Chi. Um, this is a, a social memory of the everyday, finding its way to the present along very carefully constrained pathways. Very charming, but including the politics of the period. And the Taiwan storyline is, is very striking for the absence of politics. You can also draw a distinction between the Japanese period, uh, which has long been very present in Taiwan's cultural life and urban landscape. There's scarcely a Japanese colonial building left in Taiwan these days. It hasn't been turned into an arts, design, shopping, cultural precinct of some form. Um, and in cinema, especially, uh, the Japanese period has often been represented through nostalgia and through uh, uh, complex and interesting ways often quite subversive in terms of, of Taiwan's cynicization during the martial law period, but generally uh, um, nostalgic rather than uh, critique. More current uh, uh, modes of uh, memorialization place, um, uh, but these more current ones we're talking about today, they place 
Um, the authoritarians say one is ethnic temper. Um, and we can see here they come into terms with the Puritans fully implicated in some of the ethnic making uh, relationships. In detention, especially in the original video again, the suffering of the past experience of the hands of the capricious state is, as it were, fatal. Uh, truths about human aspirations are frequent and emotions are dashed by circumstances and the incomprehensible acts of an inhuman state in which the protagonists in the implication of the game are ultimately unlucky. Um, there are ways, uh, there are, one can imagine that the, uh, the, the fate of the protagonists wasn't necessarily a given, it was fated to a degree. Therefore, in the contemporary remembrance of martial law period, in creating this moral purpose and structure for the practice of remembering, the past finds its way to the present, and in doing so, they've been rendered comprehensible. So the trajectory then is of fated events in the past that befell individuals and families in the 60s and the 80s being subject to narrative closure in which their moral values have become clear. So the past in the contemporary remembering of the period of the time of the Martin Law period has been written into a story of time of modernization and as a life world that has gone from injustice to justice, from victims, uh, from people being victims of a capricious state and then the fate acts of the violence by the state to the agency of remembering uh, with a clear moral structure. So the, um, this uh, aspect of remembrance of its implication in Thailand's nationhood and eternity is a far bigger project, however, than cultural representation. We need to talk about it briefly about that. It's a much larger project than that. Um, it's become deeply implicated in the ways I've been alluding to uh, with democratic state building and the institutionalization of memory. Um, in the memory of the period, which shaped subjectivities and aspirations uh, and traumas for individuals, this is now being built out far beyond culture into history writing, justice, politics, and so on through an array of projects and institutions that are at the scale of the nation state. And the last several years, this aspect of remembrance is illustrated by the very less significant uh, legislative and governance work done by the Taiwan government, successive Taiwan governments, to institutionalize memory. In this, in this activity, the memory of the martial law period has been transformed into nothing less than a second the nation building project. The most recent example of that is the Transitional Justice Commission, which is a, a signature. Uh, um, Policy outcome of the project. Now, we just worked with the legislative framework involved in the legislative framework, most recently the Political Archives Act 2019. And this has undertaken the task of storing, indexing, and managing archives of hundreds of thousands of documents created by Taiwan security apparatus in the martial law period. It includes a vast amount of surveillance data, reports, transcripts, photographs, and much else. The archives are outward facing but not towards researchers like a research library, although they never exclude that possibility, but they face victims and their families very directly. So a significant amount of the work of the Transitional Justice Commission is directed at managing the archives so they are accessible and open to interpretation by victims uh, and their families through outreach and interpretive processes. Now, there are these programs, seminars for victims and families, as, a, as well as the archives, the physical archives themselves. There's a huge amount of work going on to um, create ways for uh, victims and families to understand and engage with this. Now, and this is only just one aspect of a very significant institutionalization project in Taiwan in many, many years, you know, right back to the 1990s, that includes the National Human Rights Commission, the uh, National Human Rights Museum, the 228 Peace Park and uh, Museum. National 228 Memorial Museum in Shantan, and so on, the National um, Museum of Science History, and more. And there are multiple oral histories, art exhibitions, and so forth, far more than any one person can be fully responsible for that. This work also includes numerous revisions of the legal instrument for compensation of victims and families. Again, this is a, a complex story unto itself, uh, beginning with 228 um, compensation in the 90s and continuing next. Now, we can make an analogy of this work, and this work of archivization, um, to the records of the Stasi in East Germany. 
And because similarly, open depictions in the family is sometimes very painful for the outcomes. This history is all one of the spars the archives have become a record of Germany's propaganda of the citizens. The Germany that, re um, that represented an historical detour, as it were, from Germany's true post World War II national development of a liberal democratic state driving the European project for better or worse. This abuse has started the archives with a deep sense of tragedy of lives damaged and destroyed for a state that no one can see, as a caution against hubris and an uncritical belief in states and their ideologies. Taiwan's archival institutionalization, in contrast, validates a Chinese truth or a correction of Taiwan's national story in which the practice of remembering the martial law period as a clear moral place in Taiwan's identity and nationhood. The Transitional Justice Division archives have a purpose that defines the moral structure of the Taiwan story that, set, that sets right against wrong and validates Taiwan's progress as Taiwan itself, as yeah, Taiwan. Um, so they, 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 this contemporary work exists in a really interesting, they're really interesting comparisons with uh, say East Germany, but they're very specific uh, features of Taiwan's uh, engagement with the institutional French with the Marshall Law Theory. The result of all of this is a, what I'm calling a terrain of memory making. There's a lived experience that is remembered and moves ceaselessly across political and cultural domains, mobilized by institutions, state power, commerce, and cultural life. In its movement across the decades of period of Taiwan's history, memory has been remade, moving from being regulated by state ideology and authoritarian systems, represented in cultural production as a and institutionalized and represented in a democratic state project of memorialization and archivization and bestowed as a moral purpose of nationhood. These developments are remarkable to see. They're validating the notions of progress, liberalism, democracy. But needless to say, um, the work of remembering in Taiwan is hardly hard to contest. The moral structure of memory established in institutions and culture, by definition, defines the past in terms of right and wrong, justice and injustice. And in the structure, it is Republican Taiwan, the ROC, and the KMT party state of the martial law period that are rendered as wrong. They are a deviation from the course of the realization of Taiwan's identity. And the work of remembering imbues that understanding with a particular moral force. But Republican Taiwan has made its own claim of righteousness through the history of the Republic as a revolutionary project and against communism in the Cold War. And that um, continues into the present for a certain importance. This leaves the symbolism of Republican Taiwan with a very strange and discomforting status. It represents a lived history of course, of great importance for many people in Taiwan today. But it is, as it were, the wrong history. It is the history of the nation state and the grand Republican revolutionary project that has been left behind by the development both in Taiwan and in the uh, uh, PRC but without a sense of closure. Again, we can make the comparison with the East German experience, where the version of Germany ended in a formal sense, in which memory exists as a tragic salutary reminder of that. Now, whereas the history of the martial law period informs the modern structures, the structures of modern Taiwan, the moral structures, even as the Republic of China endures legally, politically, and symbolically, and in parallel with a Taiwan that has not yet been fully realized as a state. In Taiwan, this is very visible. Um, the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial in central Taipei is the most obvious example of a structure that contends and destabilizes the discourse of contemporary Taiwan in a range of ways. It's a tourist attraction, it's an exhibition space, it's a discomforting memorial to a bigger and period of memory of this structure. Um, the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial has been subject to countless debates and interventions over many years that respond to its discursive instability. So the picture on the, the top um, left hand side there was 2008, the end of the French at the end period, where uh, the Chiang Kai shek Memorial was turned into an exhibition to democracy and human rights. Um, and the, the honor guard was taken away. And there have been lots of those sorts of things over the years. Another example is the sculpture park in Zilin, which has been composed, uh, which contains a number of uh, Chiang Kai shek. Uh, statues as well as a few of the Tianjin Board and Chun Lai Sen. Um, and these have been gathered from across the island in the democracy era um, that people have decided that they didn't want the statue of Chiang Kai 
shape, you know, in the middle of a, an intersection of the Lord's school or something. A lot of the statues have been destroyed, but a lot of them have been gathered into the sculpture park um, in, in Kauri. Um, the arrangement of uh, the statues together in this way has a few legitimizing effects, of course. They've become slightly absurd as they are grouped together. As the aura of state power that they once represented is dispelled, we chuckle a little bit rather than marvel or feel or despise. They're rendered safe and manageable in this, this uh, inquisitive way in a political sense, and they're open to reflection and inquiry, which I don't think is incompatible with the institutionalized and more clear memorialization of the martial law period of the, of the democracy era. We see in the sameness the mechanism of state power of authoritarianism, of power that is mass produced literally by a state machinery that is aiming to control that was aiming to control the public place and so and so decided to resist it. Um, that effect can work when statues are in isolation uh, and it takes on a sort of political aura. But when you group them all together in this way, you arrange them in this way, they're all looking at each other and sort of in the strengths of dialogue with each other, all the exchange. Um, they're almost like pop art, they're almost more Hollywood, they're kind of commentary on the mass production of state power and authoritarianism in a gorgeous political economy. But just beyond the Tsugu's uh, sculpture park is. Um, uh, just along the road here, on the road along the lake, is Chiang Kai-shek's actual mausoleum, where his actual corporeal form is interred. So this is the past arriving into the present in a rather more raw and unmediated form. It's not commodified or reinvented in art or even much as tourism. It's not a very popular tourist spot. It remains encoded by state power, not just for the ceremonial military presence of which there is. But also an armed military police presence, which is, is right there. So the mausoleum is guarded, um, and it's open only certain times during the week. And the actual mausoleum itself, when you enter, is blocked these days by a perspex barrier, and it cannot be approached by members of the public. And it's been the case since 2018 when there was a, um, an attack on the mausoleum by um, activists who sprayed uh, red paint across the coffin and um, and pulled away the cross that was pronounced. Um, in the Chiang Kai shek mausoleum, we see the occlusions in the memorialization of the martial law period. There are subjects of memory that, despite saturation in, in kind of public life uh, of history and its vast institutional, commercial, and cultural projects to accommodate the memory of the martial law period, there are subjects that remain literally and figuratively unapproachable. Chiang Kai-shek remains present as a figure in Chinese life, but um, the work of remembering him when, uh, continues on and remains for, for his own. So his work of presence is what I think we could call supplementarity in the sense of charity. Um, it's a recursive deferral of memory. It's a site of the real that both exists as unexampled of memory, but also animates Taiwan's historical journey away from authoritarianism towards its societal capacity to address the past in the multi-form way it does. So in this sense, Chiang Kai-shek cannot be remembered and he cannot be forgotten. And that's what supplementary means. With Chiang Kai-shek's um, uh, corporeal form, that process of the realization of individual and distinct kinds of identity, free from that of RSD, I think even the entanglement of time is not through this proliferation of memorialization, archivization, representation, and so on, is both impossible to close but impossible to animate without it. So, in Taiwan today, there's a strain of memory in which the subjective experience of the past is being unfolded, released into cultural politics, and so on, imbued with moral clarity and comprehensibility, a journey of truth and reconciliation, nature building for itself. It's the making of, an of a comprehensible and individual traits of. For the people who inhabit Taiwan, both literally as citizens, but also for activity. But in the mausoleum of Chiang Kai shek, that interprets the body, it points to a strain of memory making that is not so much incomplete or resistible, but it's propelled by his continual existence. Uh, in this idea that Chiang is a necessary supplement to modern Taiwan, um, is how the martial law period uh, continues to define. The boundaries or the parameters of memory making in modern Taiwan. So when we look at Chang, we can see a kind of a window into the past that 
think it's supposed to continue in terms of what memory has been and how it how works in contemporary Taiwan. The corporeal form alludes to the politics and geopolitics of memory, a mental landscape set in the martial law period that propelled it to remember us today. Specifically, the thing that's alluded to us is he defines memory as a legitimate function of the state. Um, a function that the post martial law Chinese state has taken over and exercised in the name of democracy and corruption. This framing of the parameters of, uh, the, of national memory and its state intervention in Taiwan spread, of course, from the 228s. 228 is a binding trauma of modern Taiwan, shocking and total events of violence across Taiwan, and historical rupture that defines the Taiwan story. We know. Um, and the way that it was subject to state directed forgetting in its totality to a level that other comparisons are hard to find. 1989 in China is close, but the geopolitics of it is different. Tutuay was widely known about internationally in the late 1940s. Um, there was a case that led uh, to the event itself with the United States to abandon support for the nationalists. But by the early 1950s, it began to be subject to forgetting. So all of the writing, reporting about the one, about Sutoy was forbidden, very, and very quickly the event began to disappear from the public historical record. And it began to reappear in 1986, for the public in the newspaper that I found, um, uh, remained very contentious in terms of how to remember it for, for several years. By the early 1990s, it had restabilized and it was remembered as the appalling crime and tragedy that it, that it was. Now, the uh, contestation continued into the 1990s. Chichuay was censored by an authoritarian system for 40 years, but understood as a state intervention in memory making, or state directed forgetting. The erasure of Chichuay was intrinsic to the ROC KMT party state remaking of subjectivity in Taiwan. The act of erasure made possible the project to try to remake the people of Taiwan into the KMT ROC, the ROC party state image. It demonstrated the power of the state to remake subjectivity itself by controlling how people remember in the past. That is, Tutuay was never an absence of memory. Rather, its memory created a mechanism or its reign of power for the ROC state to try to remake Chinese identity. In the terms of the supplementarity, then, Tutuay was a force that held the state building of subjectivity and state power itself in the ROC on Taiwan. It was an event that could never be remembered but could never be forgotten. So it, there's a parallel between the martial law period and the, the democracy period in terms of the, the, the structure of memory, how it kind of works across the two periods. And as we know, of course, the KMT project failed under these contradictions. Now, the KMT party states could never remake the subjectivity of the people of Taiwan and the Republic of China the Republic in China, and with democracy, alternative pasts, present, and futures have flourished and um, contended in its own the imaginary. In its way, as a terrain of, in its way, well, as a terrain of memory, the time its way to state building in which the past and tomorrow mirror the present, an Orwellian vision of the power of the state to uh, of total state control of memory and therefore subjectivity has been dismantled, and memories have returned to the present also mobilized um, by a state, a democratic state, in the name of Taiwan, with a different and righteous moral structure. So Taiwan, as ever, when we love it so much, presents us with a compelling historical experience through which fundamental questions of the state politics and entity subjectivity intertwine. But this is uh, 2021, and any account of memory in Taiwan today um, any account of memory in Taiwan today is framed by current and future events when existential questions have become salient again in Taiwan. These geopolitics are attested the importance of memory as an aspect of Taiwan's cultural and political life and also concretize uh, the open reflection on the past and the present. Uh, in, uh, and the present in, in Taiwan into an urgent or more urgent past. So, when there's a military threat over Taiwan, are these complex reflections on how to remember the past 
and decide the point to more important than ever. To put it another way, in the era of a rising China, is Taiwan's presence already in the region? And this brings us to the Xi era. So the Xi era has destabilized many narratives in geopolitics uh, and uh, political economies around the world. And note, of course, um, for many China people listening, that uh, the Xi era is a misnomer. We can talk about it at the beginning in 2009 and so on. It is a kind of contingent shorthand for this disruption that has been um, uh, 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 upon the world by contemporary politics in Beijing. So now we have um, wolf warrior diplomacy, the assertion of party authority, the, very, uh, the visibility of the PRC's total system. Geopolitically, the Xi era is a time for American politics and uh, so-called strategic competition. So I wanted to place the back to those in geopolitics. In the last 12 months, we've seen uh, very significant uh, tactical steps um, from Beijing uh, towards Taiwan, most notably the kind of military flight into the Taiwan Strait, numerous analyses and other predictions of conflict. Um, and this really took over the Soviet uh, public debate in, in April and May this year. So the work of the Taiwan government and um, uh, the Chinese people to institutionalize their past and open memory for history is now framed by its contingency in the face of China's militarization. The possibility of kinetic military action in the single industrial complex space. So Taiwan today is haunted more acutely than for a long time by the future as well as the past. Just as in Taiwan's current moment, in which Chiang Kai-shek represents the wrong past, the diversion from the truth of Taiwan is a place with more than a century of post imperial aspirations for identity, nationhood, democracy, and democracy. His corporeal presence is a reminder that in the Xi era for the PRC, um, it is a sovereign democratic Taiwan that is the wrong past in a PRC future of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So, were Taiwan to fall under the authority of Beijing, the experience of Taiwan through the master world period and the democracy period. Um, the parameters of memory that we've set, the importance of the state, institutionalization, representation, um, uh, the, uh, all tell us um, the parameters of the remaking of subjectivity were Taiwan to form, um, fall under the authority of Beijing. So the work of memory would be a foundational part for the PRC state. And it would seek to enact new structures of remembering and forgetting to transform the people of Taiwan into subjectivity for the new China. For Beijing, as it says all the time in its Marxist ideology, this is the correct path of history. And Taiwan's current path is the wrong path. For Beijing today, uh, Taiwan is always already the memory of the wrong history. From this period, one can speculate, would Beijing rehabilitate Chiang Kai-shek? Uh, it might valorize particular leaders, I'm sure they are. I think it would be uh, the kind of person who will seek to hold up the Chinese Korean warlord. Um, but like the KMT state of the martial law period, and also for the democratic Taiwan, supplementarity is a necessity in any imagined process. So from Taiwan's presence today will come that which cannot be remembered and that which cannot be forgotten, so as to propel a PRC state building project on Taiwan. And needless to say, for the sovereign democratic Taiwan today, it is all of the people of and all of the Chinese people who would be their supplementarity. It is the people of Taiwan who could not be remembered as Taiwanese, but could not be forgotten as Chinese. This, of course, is a vision of um, an unspeakable and unbearable crisis. Now, the nearest equivalent today would be the experience of people of Hong Kong, and Xinjiang, and China as well. Um, and this possible future gives the work of remembering the past in Taiwan, a contingency and an urgency. It is remembering to preserve the past in the face of a military threat. It's also creating the material of Chinese state building and, and Chinese subjectivity. Um, but it's also creating the material of Chinese nation building and subjectivity that the PRC party state itself needs to exercise power to remake Chinese subjectivities as Chinese. So remembering martial law in, in Taiwan is a mode of democratic nation building, also set uh, a basic form of resistance against domination by the PRC in the present, but it is also a contingent challenge to the future. 
creates the conditions of uneasiness that will always generate the contradictions of remembrance if Taiwan is ever subject to the person of party states fragilizing impacts. So for those of us here who are from Taiwan or are invested in your story, you know, for whom Taiwan is an object of inquiry, cannot and should not be disengaged from our subjective experience, for those of us who care and love Taiwan. The step change in, in geopolitics around Taiwan that necessitates thinking the unthinkable carries a lot of emotion. When Xi Jinping gives a speech mentioning Taiwan, one cannot but feel a sense of foreboding. And I felt that in, in the, the centenary of party um, his big speech. Um, will this be the moment when a timeline is set or a phrase is used that gives the green light um, to action by the PLA? But my final point, when we observe Taiwan from Australia, we're reminded that the Kansi Party State's uh, forgetting of Chu Tuoi in the Martin Wall period was also a geopolitics of forgetting. It was legitimized by the consolidation of the Cold War, Taiwan's status as a US ally, and so on. It was legitimized too, however, uh, over and over by Taiwan's emerging status as a Chinese, as a tiger economy, whose narrative always began uh, after um, 1949 and erased everything before. There's always been voices in, in Australian policymaking, and there's plenty now, who live in the PRC's future in which Taiwan is already cut off now. But this prospect needs to be taken seriously. In thinking about Taiwan and Xi era, we need to conceptualize what a vast global political and institutional project it would be to forget Taiwan and only see China. It's a project that would tear its opportunities and rupture politics around the world, far beyond Taiwan. So the work of Taiwan studies would be radically destabilized, transformed under these conditions. And the, instead of accounts of democratization, identity, development, culture, um, would become a mode of scholarship that would collapse the distinction for, for many of us between scholarship and activism. That possibility hovers like a specter over this conference and all of us who work on Taiwan. So in the Xi era, as we discussed remembering the past in the Martin Law period, we must also remain alive to how the present in Taiwan will be remembered. Who will get to, and who will get to remember it? We can recognize the intrinsic power of memory to resist scholarship. The unquotable, and in doing so, we can resist in all things Taiwan liberation. Thank you.